Okay, class, we're going to be going into the second phase of our talk on the muscular and neuromuscular system. So what we spoke about last time was the sliding filament theory and how calcium is a major player in muscle contraction. It is released from sarcoplasmic reticulum, causing the activation sites or the active sites on the actin to open up to allow the myosin globular head to attach. ATP must be present in order for the myosin globular head to attach to the actin. Once it binds to the actin, there's a power stroke that occurs which actually causes the muscle contraction. In order for the myosin globular head to detach, ATP comes back into circulation, allows this detachment to occur, and the muscle to come back down to rest to do it all again. As we said, Again, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and from the depolarization of the T-tubules. This is how it is released down to the muscle fiber. So again, here are the T-tubules right here, that thin line right between here. When that is that charge changes, these little yellow channels right here is where the calcium is circulating through, is released down in the muscle fiber, which is which all fibers are basically cir being circled and surrounded by these two by the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, how does this all work? How does this come together? So, in order for the muscle contraction to occur, an impulse needs to be sent down from a nerve, or as we call a, a, you know, a motor neuron. So, a motor neuron and a muscle make up a motor unit, right here. Where they attach is called the neuromuscular junction, all right? The motor end plates right here on the nerve bind, uh, adhere, bind to the muscle to allow for the current and the communication to occur. So once an impulse or action potential is sent down, it causes the muscle to contract. Now, it's this impulse that is sent down that stimulates the release of acetylcholine, which we say, again, causes the release of calcium for the muscle contraction. Now, it's important to note that when a Nerve sends a signal down. It is all muscle fibers are firing. All the actin is being, all the myosin is binding to the actin, causing the muscle contraction. So when we broke it down into the segments, the sarcomeres of the myofibril or the muscle cell, you have all those sections of the actin and myosin all the way down that run all the way down the muscle. They all fire. Not some of them, not a few. They all fire or none at all. So that leads to the whole act, all or none principle. All muscles will fire, not some. So, when the motor neuron sends an impulse down the nerve cell, it, it stimulates the contraction of a muscle. Now, depending on what type of muscle the nerve is, is bound to dictates how it will fire. So, you have a nerve bound to one muscle, let's say. Most likely this would occur in fingers or in the muscles of the eyes. Finer movements need to be a little bit more precise and accurate. So... Probably not the best way to phrase it, but it needs to be more precise in the movements. So you have one nerve to one muscle. Now in a muscle like the quad, bigger muscles, more powerful explosive muscles, glute, quad, chest, you'll have one nerve connected to a number of different muscles. This will allow for better synchronization and firing of the muscle to create a smoother muscle contraction, but more forceful muscle contraction. So you could have one nerve stimulating one muscle or one nerve stimulating up to a hundred muscle fibers. So, let's drill this home. Again, action potential trigger, triggers a muscle contraction. The potential or impulse goes down the nerve, down to the motor end planes, or right where the muscle and the nerve meet is called the neuromuscular junction. This is where the communication occurs. So, the acetylcholine right here is basically a chemical neuro a neurotransmitter or an electrical impulse storing this energy right here to send it across the synaptic cleft that's that gap between the axon and the muscle fiber itself and you have these little channels right here on the sarcolemma that remember encases the muscle muscle fiber or the muscle cell so this electrical stored balls of energy diffuse across the membrane of the synaptic cleft adhere to these channels. This causes that depolarization to occur in the T-tubules.
So here's a, here's just a quick recap of what I literally just said. So now you have it in written form. Okay. So here's it from a, a little bit like bird's eye view. So you have the, the actual impulse coming down all the way down to where the nerve and muscle connect at the neuromuscular junction. So here's the axon. Here's the inside. The acetylcholine is floating around. That energy comes down, stimulates these things to migrate down to the axon wall. They diffuse across the synaptic cleft into the membrane of the sarcolemma. This sends a, a message all the way down to the T2 tubules, which causes it to depolarize, stimulating the, stimulating the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into circulation. This now binds to the actin, opening up the sites, allowing the myosin globular heads to bind to actin, causing the muscle contraction. Again, with the presence of, that is right, ATP. So, I want to show a brief video. It's about four minutes long. You'll also have this link right here that you can replay over and over and over again because you love this video so much. So here we go. The contraction of the skeletal muscle generates the force necessary to move the skeleton. A contraction is triggered by a series of molecular events known as the cross-bridge cycle. In a skeletal muscle fiber, the functional unit of contraction is called the sarcomere. A sarcomere shortens when myosin heads and thick myofilaments form cross-bridges with actin molecules and thin myofilaments. Formation of a cross bridge is initiated when calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum bind to troponin. This binding causes troponin to change shape. Tropomyosin moves away from the myosin binding sites on actin, allowing the myosin head to bind actin and form a cross bridge. Also note that the myosin head must be activated before a cross bridge cycle can begin. This occurs when ATP binds to the myosin head and is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy liberated from the hydrolysis of ATP activates the myosin head, forcing it into the cocked position. A cross bridge cycle may be divided into four steps. Step one, cross bridge formation. The activated myosin head binds to actin, forming a cross bridge. Inorganic phosphate is released, and the bond between myosin and actin becomes stronger. Step two, the power stroke. ADP is released, and the activated myosin head pivots, sliding the thin myofilament toward the center of the sarcomere. Step three, cross bridge detachment. When another ATP binds to the myosin head, the link between the myosin head and actin weakens and the myosin head detaches. Step four, reactivation of the myosin head. ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy released during hydrolysis reactivates the myosin head turning it to the cocked position. As long as the binding sites on actin remain exposed, the cross bridge cycle will repeat. And as the cycle repeats, the thin myofilaments are pulled toward each other and the sarcomere shortens. This shortening causes the whole muscle to contract. Cross bridge cycling ends when calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Troponin returns to its original shape, allowing tropomyosin to glide over and cover the myosin binding site on actin.
Okay, and there you have it. So make note of this on the video so you can fast forward through this and not have to watch that video each and every time you need to review these PowerPoint slides. Okay. Nerve impulses, also known as action potentials. Oh, we don't want to hear that again. No way. Oh, oh back to it. So, as you know, there, there are two types of muscles in the body. We have our type 2 and type 1. Our type 2 is more of the fast twitch anaerobic muscles, and then we have our type 1 slow twitch aerobic muscles. Our type 2 are more for the explosive strength type training exercises, where slow twitch is more the endurance-based fatigue resistance type exercises. Okay. So, Remember, when it comes to these two muscle fibers, you have uh, different energy sources and how they produce reproduce ATP. So with the fast twitch muscle fibers, the type 2, there's two versions of it, two subtypes, type 2X, type 2A, which is more of the hybrid between type 1 and type 2. Type 2X uh, is a little bit faster because it has to reproduce ATP a lot faster without the presence of oxygen. So type 2X muscle fibers are more fast glycolytic. Type 2A or intermediate fast oxidative glycolytic. A little bit of oxygen is present, but not mainly. Then you've got the slow twitch muscle fibers. Takes a lot longer to reproduce ATP because there's more of it to use. And this is more slow oxidative, longer duration to reproduce ATP. So, the biggest difference between the two is demand of supply of energy. So, with type 1, it's high aerobic energy supply. Type 1 muscle fibers are more resistant to fatigue while you go for longer duration. That's why the intensity, though, won't be as high. The higher intensity, the faster you deplete those energy stores. So, that's why you work at a lower intensity. Type 1 muscle fibers are more the uh, go-to guys for conducting the movement over and over again. Then, with our type 2... They're a little less. Um, they're a little bit more fa easily fatigued out because you know you can only do a sprint for 10 to 200 meters, and you really start to feel, let's say, yourself fatiguing out. You can't do an all-out sprint for a mile. It's just no way. There's, it's impossible. So that's why you have to go into the little bit more of a lower end aero anaero aerobic type of training style. So with the type two, they're they're a little bit easily fatigued, but because they're working, they're able to work at a higher intensity. All right more rapid force development. So, force production. So what basically determines the amount of force production or how much um, force is produced is the number of motor units recruited and how often they send the electrical, dis the electrical charge down the neuron to the muscle. So if a muscle is never allowed to fully relax because of the uh, constant stimulation coming down the neuron, this increases the level of uh, tension on the muscle or the force of contraction. Okay, so here's a little chart right here. So when we compare all three muscle types, the rate of contraction from type 1 slow twitch to type 2 is significantly different. So in the same amount of time, in order for this to reach maximal shortened velocity, full contraction is significantly lower, about 1.25 compared to the fast twitch of type 2X, which is a little bit more around 3.5. So big difference right here. And as you can see, the type 2A, the hybrid of the two, a little bit more uh, fatigue resistance than type 2, but less so than type 1. Okay. So when it comes to muscle contraction, the less muscle force required to carry out the action recruits requires fewer motor, motor units to fire. Higher force muscle contraction, a jump, a max lift, is going to recruit more motor units because you're now firing into larger muscle fibers. Okay? So the motor unit recruitment increases the number of motor units, increases the amount of force. It recruits muscle fibers from the low, less needed, uh, the, the more sensitive to stimulus to those that are a little bit more resistant to stimulus and need a higher, more of an impulse sent to them. So what does that mean? So, real simply, so look at these two movements right here. You have a woman performing a very, very 
heavy deadlift, maybe for her it's her warm up, and picking up of a pen. So when we're picking up a pen, you don't need to have the big, larger uh, muscle fibers firing. You could have the little ones. Regardless of how fast it's done, it's still not a heavy force or tension needed to be developed in order for there to be the picking up of the pen. Now, as the amount of weight or resistance increases, you're going to have to develop more tension in order to break that plane of contact between, let's say, the weight and the ground. So it starts recruiting. So the motor units are firing down the mu muscle to the muscle. Tension is developing and still not enough. Oh, still not enough with the type 2A. Oh, now the type 2X is firing bigger muscle. Boom. Now you can actually break that plane of contact with the weight and the ground. All right. So this is how it works. So we'll go back to that deadlifting photo of the girl. So she initially starts to pick up the weight. Stimulus is sent down. The type 1 muscle fibers that require you know less, uh, less stimulation in order to fire start coming into play. Hmm, that's not enough to actually lift the weight. So now the type 2, 2A fibers start firing, still not enough. Now it's causing the type 2 X muscle fibers to take on the contraction. So all types of muscle fibers are coming into play when we're doing a heavy load. And you're going to need endurance to lift the weight. You're going to need it to move fast and even faster. All right. So the order of recruitment of the units goes from low to high. So real simply put, you know, slow twitch, lower threshold in order to stimulate that increase, uh, stimulate that uh, muscle contraction. So these are more exercises like jogging or swimming or even weightlifting, but more light to moderate, very lightweight, slow, not too explosive. Now, when it comes to the higher end of the spectrum right here of motor unit recruitment, you know, fast twitch, they're bigger muscle fibers, as you can see, so it's going to require a bigger stimulus, all right? Bigger stimulus being sent down repeatedly much faster than with the slow twitch, so this will allow for the weight to be lifted. So this is with more explosive type lifts, sprints, Olympic lifts, jumps, plyometric type exercises. The bigger the force of contraction and the faster rate the bigger the motor unit. So the type of motor unit recruited is based on the physiological characteristics or demands of the sport, let's say. So long distance run, you're going to have predominantly low, slow twitch muscle fibers type 1 being recruited. Now, granted, when you get to the end of the race, you might have that final push where they kick it up a notch. Now that they're pushing themselves a little harder, you're going to have recruitment of maybe more the type 2A muscle fibers, maybe even type 2X. But those will only come into play at the end because there's no way you can depend on those muscles for an entire long distance run. Now, again, with the near max performance, power clean, a sprint, you're going to have the fast twitch muscle fibers recruited. These are the bigger ones, the stronger. They have to be bigger to handle the load and the tension that they develop. In order for those to fire, you're going to have to first fire the type 1, then the type 2A, and then finally the type 2X step up because they're the big dogs that have to get the job done. So here's a chart, kind of a breakdown of you know the characteristics of what go the differentiate that differentiates type 1, type 2, and type 2X. Now a couple things: the motor motor neuron size. So in, this, in the type 1, smaller muscle fibers doesn't require a big stimulus in order to force a contraction to occur, so the motor neuron size isn't as big. But then when you get to the more explosive type muscles, which are bigger, require a bigger motor neuron to stimulate a, an actual muscle contraction. And then and from that initial earlier chart with the, the bar, chart, bar graph I showed you, nerve conduct, conduction velocity, much slower in the, in the type 1, much faster in the type 2. As you can see, we can go down this list, see the comparisons, everything here. Here's the type 2A, where fatigue resistance. So, less fatigued, very high resistance to tiring out. These can't hold that high level intensity as long. They fatigue out very quickly. Here's the hybrid, the in-between. Can last a little bit longer than the type 2X, a little less than the type 1. And this, colors, this goes all the way, all the way down. Now, the biggest thing right here, red is the type 1, white. Coloring is type 2X. It's red because it's getting more oxygen and blood flow to the type 1 muscle fibers because oxygen is needed in order to allow for the whole energy producing process to occur. Not so much so here in the type 2X. All right. So 
Ooh, and here's another little section of the type of events that require um, these muscle types. So 100 meter sprint, it's a, you know, it's a long duration, but it's a fast, fast, high intensity activity, higher muscle fibers. Now you get into some of those weird odd sports like tennis or boxing where it's an endurance base, but they're still explosive. Yeah, you have to have high endurance for, say, the lower body, but then the upper body is type 1, type, uh, type 2. Muscle fibers probably a little bit more heavier on the type 2A when boxing and tennis because it's going over and over and over again. But there's quick glances of the type 2X muscle fibers having to fire. So in some of those hybrid sports, all three muscle fibers are coming into play. But something like a marathon, swim, along those lines, is going to be heavier on the, just the type 1 muscle fibers being recruited. So when we break this down, here is basically a breakdown of the rate of firing of the muscle. So stimulus is introduced. Here is the rate of contraction, period of contraction rate. And then this is the relaxation period, how long it takes in order for it to occur again. This is basic, very basic average muscle contraction. Now when we sl slide over here, we have the type, type 2, 2X, type 2A, the hybrid, and our type 1 slow twitch muscle fiber. So you can see stimulus is introduced, muscle contracts, boom, really fast and then relaxes much quicker before type one, type 2A um, and type 1 even come close to reaching their top maximal tension. All right, As you can see here now, the type 2A, the hybrid, takes a little longer, still pretty fast, but it takes a little bit longer time to get to the full max tension than it would type 1. And then as you can clearly see, type 1 muscle fiber, dragging right behind nice and slow, takes a while, comes back down because this, again, Cross-country running is not a very quick move. So right here at the bottom, slow twitch, increased period of contraction, requires more time to reach peak force, increased period of relaxation, less, less twitches per unit time. All right. So in one minute, slow twitch muscle is going to fire a lot less than the, the fast twitch muscle fiber. Then with fast twitch, shorter period of contraction, as we can see, straight up, almost doesn't even move over. Less time required to reach peak force, shorter period of relaxation, allow this muscle contraction to occur a second time. So more twitches per unit time. So if you break, if you look at this very basically, very basic, uh, if you never train, the average couch potato, let's just say, is about 50-50 fast to slow twitch muscle fibers in their body. Now you get to the elite levels of athletes they tend to favor one or the other. So when we get to the sprinters or the weightlifters, they're predominantly fast twitch. So elite sprinter, 80-20. Elite weightlifter, 70-30. Elite marathoner, 30-70. Oh, so you can see the big difference right here. I got ahead of myself. So marathoner, different form of training. They do more endurance-based training, aerobic training. They're going to be heavier on the side of slow twitch versus the fast twitch. All right? Now, it's not to say that you can't... Now, training does affect the type of muscle fibers that these athletes have, as you can clearly see. But tra strength training, for instance, which is more anaerobic, can improve aerobic training also by increasing the cross-sectional area, cross area or the actual size of the type 1 muscle fiber. So what we look for with strength training is hypertrophy or increase in muscle size. Now... What we would like in an ideal world, if science and could really do this, is hyperplasia, which is increasing the number of muscle fibers. There's still a lot of debate over whether or not this happens in humans, but it is definitely present and happened in uh, felines or cats. All right, so get more muscle fibers, yeah, you're going to get a lot, heck of a lot stronger. But right now, for humans, all we really can do is increase muscle size. So. With endurance training, you increase oxidative capacity and the number and density of mitochondria. With this, this helps improve endurance, your overall endurance. Now, like I said earlier, um, training can alter the muscle fiber types. So it can go both ways. So if you're you know, a big time sprinter, but then you start training more for endurance-based activities and everything, your main... Uh, basically muscle pull that you're going to be targeting now is going to shift from the type 2 really, really explosive all the way down to the type 1 muscle fibers, slow twitch. And this can be reversed. If you're more, if you train more to be an endurance athlete, you can 
improve, uh, you can shift more towards the faster twitch. What this is doing is basically you're improving the firing and recruitment rates of those muscle fibers by training them. You know, repetition, repetition, repetition makes you better, becomes more autom automatic. So that was a basic uh, talk on um, putting the signing filament theory, muscle contractions to work, and giving you a little bit more background and insight into the uh, properties of different muscle fibers and muscle types.